type of value, a gross profitability premium. So what we will do is we will go through the paper and I will basically try to give you the, the red lines with the paper and the, introduce the key concepts. You know, so this is maybe easier for you to grasp the idea of the paper. And uh, I will also depict or go, go through the main tables and uh, those tables that we might skip here that are not so important. And of course, everything that I do not discuss here in this lecture, you don't need to focus on because I will not ask any questions in the exam. I will not ask any tables or any questions to any tables in the papers that I haven't discussed here. Yeah. So just that you know. Uh, are there any questions before I get started here? Then sometimes there may be some questions ex ante. So this paper here, last time in the introduction, we, I talked, uh, we were talking and we, we were discussing about uh, two different like, uh, major fields of asset pricing. We had the theoretical asset pricing uh, that is basically concerned about figuring out uh, the function. Uh, what is the exquisite function that basically ex explains the cross-section of the returns of asset I uh, at time T. And theoretical asset pricing is concerned about figuring out what could be the right function here that fits the data the best. Uh, given the framework of this uh, representative investor that maximizes her or his utility that depends solely on the consumption across time. Yeah. Empirical asset pricing, we said, is more concerned about finding a proxy for consumption. Because consumption, we already uh, figured out, is a dirty measure. You know, we have, it's, 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 it's not like, it, it doesn't measure what it should measure. You know, it's everything that is basically measured in consumption is like past, is, uh, is like sort of past consumption. It's, it's not time congruent. So people try to figure out proxies for consumption that drive, somehow, that drive a linear function, mostly, mostly linear, the cross-section of expected returns. Yeah. So I, we also said already that asset pricing is concerned with, with different assets, not only stocks, also with commodities, currencies, bonds, whatever, you, you name it. So, but most papers are probably related to what uh, is related to figuring out what drives the cross-section of equity returns. Yeah, and one one thing also just in the beginning for your thesis. Yeah, so if you if you read the top journals, yeah, Journal of Finance, Journal of uh, Financial Economics, Review of Financial Studies, so. Most papers that you find there, they are, they are related to the U.S. equity market or to, yeah, to the U.S. asset market in general. So there's a reason for that, okay? There's a reason for that. So in, in finance, we are mostly interested in market, capitalisa market capitalization. So the bigger the market, the better. And the U.S. market is perhaps the biggest market so far. And also we have... Uh, mm, a, a lot of data available already and the market is very efficient so it's not surprising that most of the research that has been done is focused on the US market and afterwards people are, figure, are figuring out how does it work in the European market or in the Chinese market or whatever so if, you've, if, if you're looking for a topic for your master thesis yeah, I would recommend you to focus first on the US market yeah, if you want to figure out something. And, uh, you know, there are always some students who, who have an idea and then they are talking about, they want to figure out something about the Taiwanese, uh, about this, uh, the equity market in Taiwan, or here in Finland, it's, it's, it's very popular to figure out something in the Finnish stock market. But, you know, in the end of the day, you should think about who cares, you know. You know people are interested in money and in big equities, and you know what's, what's happening in, in very small equity markets, you know, it's maybe not so important, okay? So you have to have good reasons for why you do what you do, you know? If you can motivate why you do what you do, you know, then, then you can do whatever, but you have to find, you have to have good reasons. 
Yeah, in your master thesis, you have to have good reasons. You have to motivate for why you do what you do. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, the paper deals about profitability. And he is basically figuring out that profitability or the past measures of profitability have uh, mm, explain the cross-section of expected returns. So if you sort portfolios based upon the past profitability, those stocks that have uh, a very high profitability in terms of different measures, they tend to outperform those companies that have the low profitability based upon different kind of measures. And this is, uh, the spread is about 0.4, 0.5, depending on the sample. And he also goes through different measures. Yeah? And in the end, he basically concludes that gross profitability is the cleanest measure. Yeah? But we will, we will go through it in, in detail. This does the paper in a nutshell. Yeah? So then he uses, I will now take this away by the way because I need the space. Uh, then he uses this measure and introduces a new asset pricing model. Yeah? So who of you does not know about the Palmer and Fan's three-factor model? Everybody, I guess, right? So that's good news. So um, in his paper, namely, he basically uh, introduces or he suggests an alternative to the Palmer and Fan's three-factor model, and it's a four-factor model, actually, where the returns, the excess returns, actually, of asset I at time T are depending on, let's say, the market factor plus the HML factor, this, which is in essence the value factor, as in the Farm and French three factor model, yeah. And beta three I times the momentum factor. And finally beta four I times his profitability factor. Yeah. Um, let me put it like that. <coughs> so I'm left hand writing, so don't uh, get too excited about my handwriting style. Yeah, so this is basically this new asset pricing model that he proposes in his paper, and he um, measures its performance against the Farmer and French um, three-factor model. Yeah? And we will, we will go through it in detail. So he says the returns, the excess returns of asset I at time T are depending on the market factor in excess form, of course, which is the same like in the Farmer and French three-factor model, plus the uh, value factor, plus the momentum factor, and his profitability factor that he now introduces in his paper. Yeah? And he compares the performance of this, of this model in terms of the intercept, which measures the uh, systematic mispricing yeah, against the Farmer and French three-factor model. And he basically, mm, as test assets, he uses different cross-sectional asset pricing anomalies. Yeah, that's basically, in essence, what he is doing. And uh, most interesting for you might be the methodological part here in this paper, you know, because you will read many papers that have to do, that do similar stuff. And, you know, all of these papers, they, they, they do the same thing, more or less. Where they sort with respect to, this paper sorts stocks with respect to past profitability, other papers sort stocks with with respect to past performance, or to the book-to-market ratio, 
or to past investments or whatever, but they use basically the same methods to prove or to basically to, to make the case. Yeah, and that's basically, that's probably the important thing for you here. So, let's go to the next page of this paper where the first interesting things are happening. So, and I mean, I guess you have to write fast because, you know, I will take many things on this. I do many things on the whiteboard, you know, and I will do, um, I will put it, of course, away very fast because I simply need the space. So, he's talking about that uh, this gross profitability is a hedge or is a premium in, in insurance for the value premium. Why is that? Yeah. So, he argues in his paper that stocks that tend to be, or stocks that are profitable, they tend to be growth stocks. So if you divide the whole universe of, let's say, NYSE stocks, let's say here are all the stocks are in this set, in this universe here, and you divide the whole universe into value stocks, and here you have growth stocks. Then, stocks that are profitable, they tend to be here. They tend to be growth stocks. So they are on the, on the short side, basically, of this value factor. So they co-move negatively with the evolution of the value factor. Yeah. But not all stocks that are profitable are growth stocks. There are also some, some stocks that are here that are value stocks, that are growth stocks. So just, just that you know. And if you remember, if you have a portfolio, yeah, let's say you, have a, you do take a position of a, of a portfolio P, and the position is invested let's say you invest 0.5, so, so half of your money into, let's say, return A. This is, for instance, the value, value strategy, and you invest the same amount of money into portfolio AB, which may be the profitability strategy. So what's then the portfolio variance? So the variance of portfolio P is 0.5 squared, so it's 0.25 of the variance from portfolio RA, which is our, which contains our, our value stocks, plus the second squared plus 0 .5 is 0.5 times the variance of portfolio B plus, now I have to take this away here, yeah. plus 2 times 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times the covariance between our portfolio RA and RB. Yeah. So the portfolio risk, if you, run a, if you invest in a certain strategy, increases if the covariance is high between those strategies. But as the profitability premium or the stocks are, most of the stocks are in the um, are growth stocks, they are, they are, they are, the correlation between value stocks and uh, this portfolio of uh, stocks that are profitable is negative because this, this covariance here becomes negative, so it's smaller than zero. That, that means that the overall portfolio variance goes down. Yeah. So the, the, the overall portfolio risk is lower if you invest in certain strategies that have a negative covariance or a negative correlation. And that's basically what the paper is about. That's why 
he argues that profitability is an insurance uh, for value strategies. So whenever they, over time, and we can see that also in the paper, if we just, so what he's talking about here already in the, in the introduction, we can see also here in one of his figures, it's, it comes here actually. Yeah. So when, whenever the risk of this one strategy increases here, the risk of the value strategy, then the other goes down. So, and on average, if you mix them 50-50, which, which is the, this line here, you have, of course, a much better performance. Uh -huh. Are there any questions concerning this, or is it clear? This is also true for any other strategies. Whenever two strategies or more than two strategies are negatively correlated and you invest in those portfolios, the overall portfolio risk is, is lower because of this term here. Yeah? To justify that this uh, profitability premium or that this, this port portfolio of, of uh, what he suggests here, this, which is long, in, long on uh, stocks that are profitable and short on stocks that are unprofitable, why this, the, the, the motivation for why this is a risk factor, he derives from a so-called valuation model, which is given on the page number, let me check it here which you see here in, that, in section two. This is the valuation model, where MT is the market capitalization or the market value of the equity. ET is the expectation operator. Capital Y are the earnings. DBT plus tau, this is the difference in the book value. And R is the required rate of return. So what you see here, you know, don't get confused, you know, Sometimes, sometimes people try to complicate things that are not so, that are actually quite simple, you know. So let's, let's say if the, you know, the change in, in book equity here, you know, you know let's say the, the assets of a company over time, you know, they are, they are depreciating, but at the same time the company buys new assets. So we can assume, if we assume that this is on average like zero over, across time, the second term here disappears and what is left is basically the discounted earnings over time. It's nothing else than the uh, discount cash flow model. So nothing, nothing fancy going, going on here. But we will come back to that model when we read or when we go through the Palmer and French paper this new paper, this five-factor model paper, then we will encounter the same formula once again. Yeah. So we can ask, how does, uh, how, how, how needs R to change when, when Y increases? Yeah. In order that the equation is balanced, how, how does R or how, how does uh, R need to change so that the equation is is uh, or that, that we have equi equilibrium here in the equation when Y changes when Y increases? So what is R? It's basically mm, the the derivative the first order der der derivative with respect to Y. And you know you can just you know figure it out if you just watch it. I mean. If, if y is increasing, then what is in the, in the denominator must also increase so that the equation is satisfied. So that's this ex explanation basically for why the required rate of return or the expected return needs to be uh, positive, you know. So if, if uh, the earnings are increasing, the, ex the expected return needs also, uh, needs, needs also to increase over time. So that's why the premium should be positive. In the same manner, you will recognize in the next couple of lectures 
that Palmer and French actually motivate their paper in exactly the same manner. You know? So they, what they do is they basically merge, among others, this paper here and some other paper, and come up with a five-factor model, which also basically makes use of this equation. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very general equation and, and very general setup. So whenever you do what you do in your master's thesis, you need to make sure that it's somehow also theoretically motivated. Yeah. So, so somehow it, 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 there must be a link to the economic literature. I mean, you, 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 you cannot just simply have an idea and, you know, and try to figure out something. So it must be somehow, there must be some, some a reason for why you do what you do and a theoretical reason, by the way. So I already told you there are, of course, different ways how you can measure profitability. And this is actually what he's talking about here in section two, in the end of, of section two. So, and he, he argues that gross profits is the cleanest accounting measure of true economic profitability. The farther down in the income statement one goes, uh, the more polluted the measure of profitability become. But, you have to prove that. And that's basically what he's doing in the first table. Yeah? Now we go to table number one. That's the first important table. So what's going on here? So what he's doing here is he is comparing three different measures of profitability the gross profitability, which is model one, the first column of table one, then he uses earnings, and the, the model is in column two of table one, and we have the free cash flow, which is the third model here. It's the third column in table one. Yeah? And he's using Farmer Macbeth regressions. Yeah? And uh, who of you has already figured out what that is. You know, because there, 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 there are many papers who use the same technique all the time, again, again, and again. It's, uh, so before we now go through that paper here, through table one, we will briefly make an ex excursion uh, and investigate this, this model. Yeah? What does Palmer, Palmer make best regressions? Because maybe you would also like to use it in your thesis at some point. So before we discuss this table, let's make an X excursion. And they actually put, have uploaded this one also in Moodle. So you have X access to the slides here. And uh, you can also, of course, you can always Google anything. Yeah? This is what people usually do, they Google. If they don't know something, then they Google just something. But not everything that you find in Google is um, correct or is actually true. So be a little bit careful when you Google something, you know, People sometimes they they just write something what they think is true. But so there are different kinds of Farmer Macbeth regressions. Yeah? This method was first developed in 1973, yeah? and there have been, of course, many modifications, which is u which is usually the case. If you come up with something, then you know over time you know people people modify your model or your method and you know fine tune everything. But that's basically the I would say the simplest approach to use this, this, this methodology has certainly also some drawbacks, like, like everything. And one of the drawbacks we will see very soon in the paper. So I will take this away now here. So how is this method working? So first of all, why, why IT in this uh, setup are basically is a vector of excess returns of stock I. So why I is simply a, re a return vector, a T by one vector of excess returns, yeah. And we have n stocks, so we have n of these vectors, n different 
y vectors. Yeah? And in this setup, we have variables x1 to xk. And if we use the farmer in French three factor model, then we would have only three x variables. Yeah? So these x variables are in our setup basically the risk factors that we have in our asset pricing model. If you use the farmer in French five factor model later on, then we would have, uh, the, then k would be n, uh, five. Yeah? So this is basically the, the regressor matrix. Uh, so X is our, re is our regressor matrix. We have a, let's denote it as capital X. And then we have the first column vector is a vector of ones, which corresponds to the alpha here. And then we have the second vector is then, for instance, our market returns in, in XS form at time T1 and so on until time capital T. And then the second, uh, the, the third column would be, for instance, the uh, SMB factor at time one. And then the last entry would be the SMB factor at time capital T. And if we now, let's, let's just assume we, we use the Farmer and Friends three factor model, then we would have here in the fourth column would be the HML factor at time T1 until time capital T, which is our re regressor matrix, and which has the dimension T by four, right? So, and what we do then? We do a simple OLS regression. We know this from econometrics, it's basic econometrics. So, we have the beta i because we do it for stock i is then x transpose x inverted times x transpose y i. So what we get out of here is basically a vector that gives us the, the alpha of the first asset. We get the beta. Sorry, I need more. The second entry is then the beta one, which is the loading against the market factor from asset i. We get the loading against the size factor, which is the beta two. It's concerned with the loading against the size factor of asset i. And finally, we get also the sensitivity, the loading against the HML factor, yeah, which is our third column vector here in our regressor matrix. So that's, it's a four by one vector. So, and we do this capital N times. So we have N stocks, let's, be, let's say we have the S&P 500, and we do this for all 500 stocks, again and again and again, we do this 500 times. So we get 500 of these beta vectors, 500. So what we do then, so this is basically the first step in this methodology. I mean, if you would do this, for instance, for the Finnish stock market, you have the OMX 25 in Finland, right? 25 stocks. This is the, this is the Finnish leading index, yeah? So you would do this then 25 times. And you, and you would get 25 of these point estimates. So what, do, what you do then, you, mean you can, you, if you just consider the S&P, uh, sorry, the OMX 25, you can do it actually via e-views. Yeah, it's very simple. You can do it via e-views and uh, you would get, you could basically write it down into an Excel file, these estimates here. Who of you did not use e-views? Did, did, did all of you take um, Ecometrics 1? Okay, good. So, and you use e-views, right? Okay, so that's basically basic OLS. You would do that 25 times and you would write down by hand into an Excel file the point estimates of this first pass regression. Now you get 25 of, 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 of these guys and you would basically create a, a matrix which I call here in this handout capital beta hat. And you would put for the these, these point estimates, you would basically transpose, yeah, you would trans transpose this column vector to a row vector and put it into the first row of this beta hat. Yeah? And you add a one 
And you do this basically for all these 25 stocks, if, you, if we consider the omics 25. Yeah? You, you take this guy, you transpose it, and put it into the second row. And the 25th guy, you transpose and you put it in, into the last row, capital N, 25. And you create this beta head matrix basically in Excel. This is what you can do. Yeah? Then you have this new beta, beta head matrix. And you can treat it basically, what we do in the, in the next step is we, we treat this beta head as, as X and do the same again. We can upload the data matrix into eViews. This, this is an our, our X matrix. And what we do next is we create a new vector. Because think now, the dimension of, this, of our beta head matrix is, of course, 25 by 5. No, by, by 4, sorry. 25 by 4. Because we have 25 test assets, or 25 stocks, if you consider the OMX 25, okay? The Finnish stock market. So what we do next is we create a new vector which has the length of 25 by 1, and we call it capital Y. And what, and what we do is we compound the average excess returns of each single stock in our stock universe. So if you consider the OMIX 25, this vector will be a 25 by 1, of course. And the first element is the excess returns, for instance, of Nokia. Surprise, surprise. Yeah? And so on. All this, we, we use all, this, all the 25 stocks that are in our stock universe in the OMX 25. Yeah? We compound, we have our sample, our T observations, and then we take the average across T for all of the stocks and put it into a 20, 25 by 1 vector. This is our capital Y. So now we have our beta hat matrix and we have our new vector that consists of the average returns of our sample of stocks. So this is what I have here. It's basically the average across Ys, or, or the average across the excess returns. Yeah, this is here in the script. And then we do the same again, basically. We do, but only one time. Now we have only one ORLS regression. So what we do is, let me just take a, a black pen here. So that is more obvious, yeah. yeah it's, we do the same again. So we, we have our lambda hat. And this is then we use our beta hat matrix prime times itself inverted times itself prime times our vector of expected returns, of average returns. Yeah? And what we then get basically are the risk premiums for all of these factors. So now let's just briefly think about what we have actually been doing here. So if we go back to the time series regression, let's say x1 is the market factor and x2 is the size factor and y is, let's say it's, it's Nokia, okay? So what is beta, this, this beta i2 telling us then? It, it's telling us how does, um, how, how, how do the excess returns of Nokia change when the size factor increases one unit? So it's, it, basically, it, it gives to us a change, it's a partial derivative with respect to the second factor here. The beta is the partial derivative with respect to the second factor, which is our size factor. But now, we use as X matrix, or as, as our regressor matrix, we use actually our estimated betas. So what, we, what we're actually doing, or what, what we try to figure out here is, how do the average returns, because now we are using the average returns, the cross-section, the cross-sectional average here, we're regressing the, vari the um, varying betas on the average returns. So it tells us what we want to, want to figure out is 
how do the average returns change if the betas are changing? And beta basically gives us the, the, the risk loading of each of the stocks. Yeah. So if the beta risk is increasing by one unit, how does this impact the expected returns, the average returns in our stock universe? And this lambda hat, what we then get basically here out of, out of the second OLS regression here, it gives us the, the average risk premium that is associated with our risk factors, yeah, with, with the size factor, the value factor, and yeah, sorry, it's, it's in, if you use the Farman French three factor model, it's, it's just it's the market factor, the size factor, and the value factor. And the risk premiums should be positive. And they should be significantly positive. So the point estimates, as we have seen, we can easily get using eViews and Excel. That's no big deal. I guess everybody can, can do that. That's no big deal. But uh, how do we get the corresponding t-statistics? That's a little bit more tricky, but what we do actually is we create, you know, we have this huge matrix here, I, 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 I call it here yt, where we have basically um, in, the, in the first column, we have the, we have the uh, excess returns of the stock number one in our sample across time. And in the last column here, we have the excess returns of our last stock. The, it's the 25th stock in our, if we consider the OMX25, across time. So what we do is, we basically, we, we take the first row, uh, which gives us the excess returns of stock one at time one, and in the last entry we have the excess returns of stock n at time one. So we, we, we grab this guy and we transpose it. So it's a 25 by one vector, okay? Is, is, is this obvious to you? Uh, this is a 25 by one vector if we take the first row. We transpose it and multiply it with this expression here what we get is the risk premium at time one. And we do this t times. Yeah? We, next, we, we take the second row here, which gives us basically the cross-sectional, I mean, no, the, the excess returns at time t1, uh, t2 across all 25 stocks. Yeah? We grab this row vector, transpose it, and multiply it again with this, with this impression that we already estimated before. We do this T times, capital T times, across all stocks. So what we get is a huge matrix yeah, with T, capital T, risk premiums. This, this guy we get. And we put it here into this big matrix here. And then what we just do is, you know, we take the average from here and divide it by the, uh, by the standard deviation. And then we get this t our t-statistic for the first risk premium. And we do this for all of our risk premiums here. Until the last guy here, the case risk premium. This is the risk premium associated with the HML factor in our case. Uh, so, and this is what we can do in Excel, basically. But, you know, this is a little bit, it's a lot of, like, work, you know, unless you do it in MATLAB. And this is basically what you will learn, or what maybe some of you might learn if you take then my quantitative finance course. Then we will do this with using MATLAB, which is very simple. You write a very short code, one row, maybe two rows, and then MATLAB is doing all the stuff for you. Yeah, so it's actually, it's actually simple econometrics and uh, the program is doing all the stuff for you. So, I mean, you don't have to do it by hand, but I mean, many, most, most uh, master students, they still do, they prefer to do it by hands using Excel. I mean, 
yeah, it takes, of course, much more time. You know, I mean, of, of course you can do that, but it, it takes much more time. If you do it in, with a program like, like MATLAB or, I think my colleague Sepp, I think he knows, he uses R, right? So you can do it, of course, also in R if you like. I prefer MATLAB. And uh, then it's, it's very simple to calculate, to do these calculations uh, using matrix algebra program. So that's basically what's going on here. And uh, I wrote it here in this little handout. And the notation is correct. And yeah, this is basically the way how it, how it works out. You will not find this in the internet. So it's just for you or the, for people who have registered for this course here. It's uh, found by make best regressions explained on like two or three pages. And uh, I think it might be quite useful for some of you. So that's, that's what he's doing here, our Novi Max paper in, first, in the first table. So he's doing this, and our regressor matrix, X, has now these variables here. Yeah? So he uses, in the first model, he uses as X matrix, as a regressor matrix, uh, the gross profitability. He uses the log book to market ratio. This is basically the proxy for the, for the value factor. It should cap the, capture the, the value effect. And here we have the log of the market equity, which captures the size effect. Yeah? We have this sm small r10. What is that? So that's basically, it's called short term reversal. So it's basically an, an effect that is described first in a paper from 1990 from Jäger and Or was it just from Jäger no, I think it was here as in Tittmann. Yeah, it was at least this, this 1990 paper, and they figured out that stocks that have performed very good in the last month tend to underperform in the next month. And stocks, and vice versa, stocks that uh, performed very poorly in the previous month, they tend to outperform out next month. So the spread is something like 1%. If you would sell, if you would sell the highest performing stocks in the last month, and you buy a portfolio of the poorest, poorest performing stock in the last month, then you would earn like 1% profit with the zero cost portfolio in the next month. Yeah, okay, something like that. So this should capture this effect. And uh, this R12.2, this should basically capture the momentum effect. So it's... Uh, it's the cumulative, cumulative path return across the, from, from month minus 2 until month minus 12. Yeah. So this is what he uses as regressors. And uh, he figures out that the point estimate here, this is the interesting thing here, is positive and highly significant. The statistic is, is 5.49, and the point estimate for gross profitability is 0.75 using NYSE stocks, if I remember correctly. And as a second measure here in model two, he uses earnings instead as a measure of profitability. And the point estimate is much lower, it's 0.22 and the T statistic 0.84. What does the T statistic of 0.84 telling you? Is the second measure, is earnings a significant measure of profitability in the cross-section of returns? Any opinion? Whenever, whenever I ask very simple questions and there's no answer from the audience, uh, the probability is 0.95 that I might ask this in the exam. What does a T statistic of 0.85 or 0.84 mean? Yeah, you have to interpret that for sure.
So under the null hypothesis, we assume it's zero and we test it against larger than zero or unequal to zero. Uh, the null hypothesis is that this point estimate beta is zero and the null hypothesis is that our point estimate of beta is unequal to zero or larger than zero. Yeah. So point estimate of 0.84 means it's, it's somewhere here. Here is 0.84. And it's obviously within these critical values of 1.96 and minus 1.96. So if it's under the null hypothesis, 95% of the probability is between 1.96 and minus 1.96. So we, we cannot reject that the hypothesis that this point estimate is statistically zero. Uh, whereas in the first case, 0.75, the t statistic is 5.49. It, it, it's somewhere here, or, or maybe here even. Yeah? So it's highly statistic, statistically significant, and it's actually positively significant. So this is our second measure, and then he uses as a third measure free cash flow. Yeah? Point estimate, the, the cross-sectional point estimate, is 0.27 with t statistic 2.28. So it's significant, obviously. It's, it's somewhere here. On a 5% level, it's, it's significant because it's larger than, 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 than 1.96. But the economic magnitude is considerably, it's, it's basically one third of our first measure, the gross profitability. Yeah? So if we consider only this subset, only this, uh, these first three models, then we can already say that our gross profitability is the, is, the, is the superior measure of all these three models. Yeah. Because the economic magnitude is the largest and moreover the significance or the statistical significance is the highest. So what's happening then here in the table is basically what, what you see is um, that he is con controlling for one, one another factor. He, uh, he is basically using um, in his regressor matrix X now he's using all the other factors as before, and he is using the gross profitability in addition with the earnings. So, and what, and what comes out is that um, earnings remain insignificant, and the point estimate goes even down, and gross profitability is still highly significant. Uh, then, model five, he is using gross profitability and free cash flow instead. And what we see here is, again, gross profitability seems to be the dominant measure. Yeah. It has a T statistic of larger than, than, than four, and free cash flow all of a sudden becomes insignificant on a 5% level, yeah, because the point, the point estimate is 0. What was it, 0. 0.2, but the T statistic is 1.64, so it's still it's below our, our critical value here, okay? So st statistically, on a 5% level, we cannot reject the hypothesis that after controlling for gross profitability, free, ca free crash flow does not, does not seem to have a cross-sectional impact here. So whenever you come up with this kind of framework here, of course you end up in some troubles. Yeah? But let's first of all consider the this, this seventh model, the last model. In the last model, he's controlling uh, for all of the factors. Yeah? He's using all of these three measures of profitability and controls for all of these uh, other measures here, like value, market equity, and this kind of momentum effect. And what we see here is after, once he controls for all of these measures, still gross profitability seems to be the only measure that actually has an impact here of all of the three um, measures for uh, earnings rated measures for profitability. Yeah. So 
first of all, there are, there are two issues here that we can discuss or that you maybe need to know. So the first issue is when you do this kind of regressions here, for instance, gross profitability, earnings, and free cash flow, actually, they measure all the same thing. So I can tell you, if we would, plot the, if we would call, check the, the correlation matrix, they are highly correlated. Have you talked about the multicollinearity problem in equilimetrics? Multicollinearity problem. That is when two or more regressors are highly correlated. It has an impact on the, on the T-statistics. So it could be that, that, some of, that some of the regressors just are significant because they are correlated or the other way around, they become insignificant because they, they are, they are um, correlated to something else. That's the multicollinearity problem. So that's why in the best case, all of these regressors would be orthogonal. They would be uncorrelated in the best case. Then we have very clean T-statistics. But now the, the T-statistics are difficult to interpret yeah, in the face of multicollinearity. So that's the first issue. Second issue. If you use this framework, this Thomas Macbeth regressions, you equal weight all of these stocks here, this, this, this Y vectors. They're equally weighted. So you, you treat small stocks as, as equally important as big stocks. And what we know is from finance literature is that's, that most anomalies are much stronger in small stocks. In, let's move on. In the second panel, he's doing the same thing, but using uh, industry-adjusted returns. Yeah. And what he basically, the important thing to take away from the second panel here, panel B of table one, is um, that all of these measures here basically become economically larger and more, and, and, and more significant in terms of uh, the statistics after controlling for industry effects. Uh, so that's the outcome. And that's basically also the motivation for why he uses in his model industry-adjusted risk factors. Any questions so far? So that's the outcome of the first table. And based upon these results, uh, he argues basically that using gross profitability as a measure for firm profitability is to be chosen because it, is the, it gives basically the most significant uh, effect. So what he's doing then is in table two, He's using value-weighted portfolios. Now he's using stocks and forms them into five different portfolio groups. Uh, he, he takes the whole universe of stocks and sorts them into five groups on gross profit to assets, so where the first portfolio group here, low, has the lowest profitability, and group number five consists of those stocks that have the highest profitability in the sample. And what we see here is, as we move from low to high, the average return is linearly increasing from 0.31 for the lowest profitability quintile to 0.62, which is the highest profitability quintile. Uh, and the zero cost portfolio that is long on stocks that have a high profitability and short on stocks which have a low profitability is 0.31 with a tier statistic of 2.49 across the sample period. Yeah. What's happening here, he is basically taking all these portfolios here, the stock portfolios, and, regress, and, and regresses them on the Farm and Friends, Farm and Friends three factor model, in accounting for it constant term here. And what we see here is the high minus low portfolio, that's the important thing here. After regressing it on the farm and trends 
three-factor model, we see that the point as, that the average return of 0.52 remains unexplained by the market factor, size factor, or value factor. And important is to notice also the loading of minus 0.44 against the value factor. What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, I will take this away here now, by the way, because we might need the space. I told you in the introduction meeting that uh, we will come back to the same thing again and again. So, if it would be positive, positive 0.44, it would mean that the zero cost portfolio, high minus low on, on profitability, would co move, it, move, it would move in the same direction with the returns of the value factor. But it's negative, it's negative 0.44. And it's highly significant, the, the history is minus 10, it's, it's, like, it's like here, you know, it's like here somewhere. So it means that the long side or that the, that the long side of, of this portfolio co-moves with the short side of the value factor. It means it is, is, it is exposed to growth stocks. Our profitability strategy is invested in growth stocks. So it, it, it correlates with the short side of the value strategy. And there, on, and, and we know that in the short side of the value strategy are growth stocks. So it's a growth strategy. And that was exactly his, his argument from the beginning. Moreover, the returns that, that he reports here are valuated returns. Yeah. Why is he using valuated returns? Well, we talked about earlier, because if you evaluate returns, you, you give higher weight to big stocks and, and, and less weight to small stocks in order to avoid this, this bias that, that, that most anomalies are more pronounced among small stocks. Yeah, panel B is not so important. Actually, I was wondering when I, when I read the paper first time, I was, I was, I was wondering why, why on earth is he, is he reporting table B? I'm, I'm still not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm for thinking about it now for three years. I'm still not sure. So what he's doing here is he's sorting stocks on, on, on the book-to-market ratio, okay, into five groups from low to high book-to-market ratio. And then here, 0.41 is the average return of the zero cost portfolio. This is, this is in essence the value factor premium. Yeah. And then he regresses this sort of value factor on a constant, yeah, this alpha, on the market factor, size factor, and on, its, and, and on the HML factor, which is the value factor. So you have on the left hand side, you, you regress something, what you have on the left-hand side, on itself, on the right-hand side. It doesn't make much sense, right? A, a, at least not to me. And you can also see here, the, the point estimated is 0.91. If it, if it would be perfectly correlated, it would be 1. t is 30. So actually, you could not even invert the matrix X, you know? You, you, you cannot invert the matrix if it's perfectly correlated with something here. So I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense. And also here, I mean, the, the alpha, of course, it's statistically not, not different from, from zero because you regress it on itself, basically. So, I mean, this table B does, for me, not, it doesn't make much of a sense. But uh, just a little parenthesis here. When, 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 when you have figured out what, what, what it means, then please, please let me know. So anything that follows here 
in his, in his paper is basically robustness checks. Yeah? Anything else are more, more or less robustness checks. So after he has shown that stocks of companies that have a high profitability outperform stocks that have a low profitability, he's doing a lot of sort of robustness checks in order to make his case strong. So, and uh, just as a little uh, parenthesis here, um, the measure of profitability, he's using accounting data, uh, basically in a similar, similar to the value factor, they, they also use, some parents also use account, past accounting data, and in one of his footnotes, he actually mentions also that the portfolio turnover is something like, uh, um, the overall portfolio is turned over, I think, every fourth year or something. So 25% of the stocks after one year are basically ex exchanged. So the, port the, the portfolio turnover is very low uh, if we consider it as an investment strategy. The, later on, we will discuss, we will talk about the momentum factor, and what we will get to know is that this strategy is rebalanced every single month. So you have, a, you have a much higher turnover and much more costs in order to get your strategy going over time. So next we have table three. We have to hurry up a little bit, I see. In table three, what's going on here? He is uh, using only big stocks as far as, I, as I'm concerned. And uh, what, he, or what, he, what he wants to show here in, in, in this table is basically important is just to know the, the last row here, that irrespective of the size of the company, the portfolio gross profits to assets, they, they have the same ratio. Whereas the uh, book to market is decreasing as we move from small stocks to large stocks. Yeah. So large stocks have a smaller book to market ratio than uh, small stocks. But the gross profit to assets, they have the same ratio here. So, but that's not so important anyway, so. Next on table four, let's move to table four. So on this table, he is controlling for size. So he uses the whole stock universe and he divides the whole stock universe into 25 portfolios. Let me just grab a pen here. Yeah. You have the whole universe of stocks and you divide it into five groups. And then you subdivide. So that's, this is maybe the section of here are the stocks that have the lowest profitability and here are those 20% of stocks that have the highest profitability. And then you sort, you divide the stocks also with respect to their size from small to big stocks. Again, five groups. And then here, basically, you have stocks that are big and have a low profitability and here you have those stocks that are big and have a high profitability. So we have 25 groups of portfolios. Yeah? So, so you divide the whole universe of stocks into 25 portfolio groups and then you take the, consider the average return which is here reported in table, in panel R of table 4. So what we see here, that the spread is linear increasing as we move from low to high profitability, irrespective of the size group. The spread is of course most, most pronounced here if we are in the, in the small stock portfolio or in the small stock universe, but it's linear increasing from 0.4 to 1.07 for small stocks. And if you're on the big stock portfolio, 
we are moving from 0.3 to 0.55 as we move from low to high profitability. So in all of these size groups, irrespective of the size, we have a we have an profitability effect. This is what this table is telling us. Moreover, on the right hand side of table four, he basically reports the zero cost strategies. So for the small group here, our small universe of, 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 of of stocks, so the small stocks in our universe, he creates a long short strategy. So given we have, we have small stocks, we have a, this is a portfolio that is high, uh, that is um, long on stocks that have a high profitability and short on stocks which have a low profitability. And the spread is 0.67 with a statistic of 4.59. So he uses this portfolio and regresses, and regresses it on the Farman Trends Prefactor model. This is what you see here. These are the point estimates, the loadings, the betas against the Farman Trends free factor model. And here we have the intercept, which is the return part unexplained by this asset pricing model. So we see here, for instance, 0.63% per month from 0.67. So almost the entire return is unexplained by the, um, by the variation of these three risk factors. The statistic of the so-called risk-adjusted return is 4.27, so it's highly significant. And here, in, in, the, in the last row on the right-hand side of table four, we see a strategy that is implemented in big stocks. Yeah? So given we have big stocks, we are, sh we are uh, long on stocks that are big and have a high profitability, and we are short on stocks that are big and have a low profitability. The spread is 0.26% per month. t statistic is 1.88. If we regress this portfolio on the farm and, on the farm and friends three-factor model, the risk-adjusted spread is 0.5, which is almost as high as for small stocks. Remember, it's 0.63 for small stocks, with a t statistic of 3.9, so it's highly significant. Yeah? And uh, the loading against the value factor, which is interesting, it's also negative. So implemented among big stocks, it's still so that we have to do with the growth strategy. Yeah? So the, the, profitability, the, the profitability strategy implemented among big stocks, it's a growth strategy because it loads, the loading is negative against the value factor. Yeah? So it, it co-moves with the short side of the value strategy with our growth stocks. So, but is that still true? If I give you this table, and I would ask you, I know I usually ask very open questions so that I, so that, so that I can give you, in worst case, at least some points, you know, if you write completely nonsense, but then I give you at least some points if you write something. But if I give you this table and, and, and I would ask you, hmm, uh, Novi Marx argues in his paper that the profitability, that the profitability strategy it's a growth strategy. Discuss. What could you then write? Well, it's a, it's a growth strategy, at least for big stocks, yes, and for medium-sized stocks, which is group four and three, yes, as well. It's negative, it loads negatively, minus 0.15, minus 0.33, minus 0.51, and all the T statistics here are significantly negative. It's a growth strategy for big stocks and for medium-sized stocks. But as we move into the small stock direction, here in, in size quintiles two, for instance, it's minus 0.08 and the T statistic of minus, uh, minus 1.58 indicates that this point estimate here, the loading against the value factor, is statistically not different from zero, so it's not a growth strategy. Yeah. For size group two, it's equally invested into value, in value stocks and growth stocks. So it's not a growth strategy. And even if you consider now the small stock universe implemented in only small stocks, the loading against the value factor is positive. It's, op it's 0 0.13 with a statistic of 2.47. It's 
statistically significantly positive, which means for small stocks, this strategy is not a growth strategy, it's a value strategy. Okay, I think I asked it once, once in an exam because I think it's so obvious, because I discussed it also in the lecture. So then, on the, in the lower part here, he's basically doing, doing it, it the other way around. He goes through, he keeps basically the, the profitability quintiles constant and implements a, a small minus big strategy given um, each of these profitability groups. And uh, what we see here is that only these last two groups here so they, you, can, you can run basically a small minus big strategy and it's profitable um, only if it when implemented among stocks that have a high profitability. Because here you see the point estimates 0 0.10, 0 0.28, 0 0.29. So when implemented among stocks that have a low profitability, S, SMB does not pay off, okay? It's not, the point estimates are not statistically significant. That's basically the takeaway from that table. Any questions? Is growth profitability defined as revenue minus cost of goods sold, sold here? Or what is it? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's, it's like that. It's in footnotes, I don't know. It's, it's very clearly defined in, in one of the footnotes here. Well, the so is this saying, this paper saying that you should find companies with a low cost structure and uh, a low or assets in the balance sheets? Uh, it says, this paper says basically that you should invest into companies that have uh, high, high gross profits to assets, that have high, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the next table in this paper, table five, you can skip because I, I skip it. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, table five is not so important from my point of view, so we can, let's, let's leave it. Yeah. We have to move on table six is again interesting. So on table six, he's doing the same or something similar. Now he is dividing the whole stock universe into again here on the uh, X, X axis from low to high profitability and on the Y axis from low to high book to market ratio. And what you see here is basically um, in, in, in every book to market quintile, uh, there's a spread as we move from low to high profitability. So given each of these groups here, stocks that have a higher profitability outperform stocks that have a low profitability. Then again, for each of these book to market quintiles, he is forming um, long short strategies that is long on stocks that have a high profitability and short on stocks with a low profitability like before basically and, re and regresses um, this portfolio on the Palmer and Strange three factor model for risk adjusting. Uh, and then what we see is here that uh, most, most of these portfolios generate risk adjusted returns that are positive and statistically significant. Portfolio group three and, and this high book to market quintile group, they, they are the outliers here. Yeah, as you see from the table, point estimate 0.27, 0.34 are not statistically significant on a 5% level, but all the others are. And then again here downstairs, what you, what you see here is he does the same thing but creates a long, long short strategy for each of these 
gross profits to asset groups. Here, for instance, in the first in the first column vector, yeah, he has this is a, this is here is the strategy that is long on stocks that have a high book to market ratio and short on stocks with a low book to market ratio. Given we have a subset of stocks that have a low profitability, the spread is 0.73 and uh, highly significant. And then we, he does that for all of these profitability groups yeah, and regresses all these portfolios on the Farman Trends three factor model. And the point, point estimates are here. And we face the same problem that we had, that I discussed with you earlier. So basically what he has here on the left hand side, we have value strategy and he regresses the value strategy here on the HML factor, which is the value factor. So for me, it doesn't make much of a sense, but obviously there are some significant alphas going on here and who knows what that means. I will not ask this in the exam, okay? This lower part, because it doesn't make so much sense to me. Oh. And then here downstairs, basically, in the panel B, he reports the average firm size for these portfolios here, for these portfolios here. Yeah. We have for each, of, for, each of this port, for each of these 25 portfolios, he reports the corresponding average firm size across time. Uh, and, um, and what we see is here that, that these extreme portfolios, for instance here, that have a high book to market ratio and a high profitability, so there, are, there are not so many, I mean, the firm size is very small. Yeah. So these extreme portfolios here, the average firm size is small. So it's somehow related also to a small, small firm effect, what's going on here. Like any, or like most of these asset pricing anomalies. Yeah. They are mostly pronounced among small stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? So this, once again, just to make it sure that you get it. So this 1.08 is means if you invest in a portfolio of stocks that have a high profitability and a high book to market ratio, so value stocks that, are, that have a high profitability, then the average return is 1.08% per month over the sample period from 63 to 2000 and, I don't know, 10 or something. Yeah. This, is, this is what it tells you. And the good thing is, as I told you already before, that this portfolio is not so often rebalanced. Yeah? Unlike the momentum portfolio that has a similar payoff of about 1% per month, but this portfolio is rebalanced every single month. So the portfolio turnover here is much lower than the momentum portfolio. So, table seven, we can skip. We don't, we don't need that. I think table eight we skip also. Table eight we skip also. Yes, and the last minutes we will talk about the implications of its asset pricing model. So I, I, I told you already um, that people, you know, you know, some of these anomalies that, that people basically, this is, that, that people, you know, they use some of these anomalies, for instance, the, the size effect was usually was in the beginning on it was introduced as an anomaly yeah because if the cap m would hold then small stocks should be priced accordingly and they should not generate higher returns than big stocks it should, everything should be basically compensated for by the exposure against the market risk factor so but what what people figured out as anomalies later on they use these these, these anomalies as risk factors once they have shown that certain of these certain anomalies are somehow correlated with uh, business cycle risk. Yeah? That's basically usually the motivation for why people use anomalies as risk factors because they show, okay, this and these factors are related to movements 
of the business cycle. And this is basically, there are many papers circulating around that basically suggest or that show that the SMB factor and the value factor that they correlate with movements in the business cycle. So there's certainly an empirical justification for why, for why people or why Pharma and French use these two factors in their asset pricing model as risk factors, yeah? So in this paper, there is no such motivation. It's purely uh, an empirical suggestion, more or less. And as I already told you, uh, his, his model has as regressors his uh, industry adjusted profitability factor. This, this star means here in this table, in table, let me see, is it table nine? In yeah, table 10. So the star means basically that we have uh, industry adjusted risk factor. So PMU star is the industry adjusted profitability factor, UMD. Is, uh, he denotes UMD as the industry adjusted momentum factor, uh, HML star is the industry adjusted value factor, MKT is the market factor. Then we have on the, the column vector here on the left hand side is basically the corresponding average return of each of these uh, cross sectional asset pricing anomalies. And what he's doing here is he is regressing each of these anomalies or cross-sectional phenomenon here on either the Farmer and Friends four-factor model. The Farmer and Friends four-factor model is the Farmer and Friends, Farmer and Friends three-factor model and has as an additional vector the momentum factor, yeah? but not adjusted for industries. So this is basically, basically the regressor matrix uh, for this output table here. And then he, he compares it with the alpha, which is the intercept of the regression where he uses his, his suggested risk factors. Yeah. So once again, here, alpha, power trend four, the risk factors are not reported. The loadings against the risk factors are not reported, okay? So it's just the intercept term. So and what we see here, if you, if you go through these anomalies here, what you see is that the average alpha, or the average mean squared pricing error, is much lower across all these anomalies when using his, his suggested asset pricing model than compared to the Parmand French four factor model, where the momentum factor is added to the three factor model. Yeah? You see, it's almost, it, it's more than twice, twice as high here. And uh, if we consider these strategies here, returns on asset, return on equity, asset turnover, gross margin, and SUE. All of these, all of these guys here are earnings rated anomalies. What we will see later on in, a, in the next lecture or, I don't know, maybe afterwards, I don't know. But, but we will also go through principal component analysis. So what we'll see is later that uh, we can break down that actually there's one factor that basically drives all of these. But, but we will do that in one of the exercises. But if you consider now, here for instance, the alphas of his uh, four-factor model for, for, for these... Uh, anomalies here that are unexpected, we see that the alphas are, all of them are un, unless SU, SUI, but all the others here, gross margins, asset turnover, return on equity, and return on assets, the point estimates are, st are st statistically not different from zero. So, which means that his asset pricing model explains those anomalies very, very well, which is not surprising because we have this, uh, his profitability factor here, and Farmer's French four-factor model that he uses here does not account for that factor. And what we also see is, let's for instance grab the return on equity factor here, this guy. The loading is 1.52 uh, against the profitability factor with a statistic of 
8.23. And all the loadings here, if we move to ether turnover, the, the loading is 2.05 and the, and the heat statistic is 13.5. Well, what does that mean? It means that these strategies are exposed, they co-move positively with the long side of this profitability detector, and we know that in the long side, in the, in the, in the long side of the zero-cost strategy are stocks that are profitable. So all of these strategies here invest in companies that are profitable, because the point estimates are positive. So this is also what I asked once or a couple of times in, 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 in exams that you basically know what it means, that you know what it means when the T statistic or when, when the point estimate, when the alpha is positive or negative and the T statistic is within these boundaries, what does it mean? Can the model explain this anomaly, yes or no? And also, I was asking questions about the loadings here that you, that you know if the loading is statistically significantly positive, it is exposed to the long side of this factor, and if it's negative, it's exposed to the short side of the corresponding underlying factor. So these are like standard questions, and there are here are many anomalies, so I can ask basically many questions given this, given this table here. So this table is certainly not unimportant for the exam. So it's two minutes to go, so I will finish now. Uh, I think that's, that's what I wanted to talk with you. I, I was a little bit in a hurry because, you know, this farm makes best regressions, it takes some time. And, uh, but I think, you know, it's a course where you need to learn some basic methods that you might could use for your master's thesis. Uh, I think that's, that's the purpose of this course as far as I've understood. And um, if there are, if, are there any questions now already? If not, then maybe you can think about some questions for next time. Otherwise, have a good afternoon.